Hi everyone, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Ariel Apura. I'm the curator of the Verilis Center for Art and Politics at the New School. I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining us for our first conversation today, our last day of the second speaker series titled Remote Control Serving Drones and Culture Today. Our program this afternoon is called Shifting Focus Representing Drones. The symposium is co-organized with, with Highline art and writer and researcher Arthur Mich Holland Michelle and examines contemporary intersections of drones and drone warfare, arts and culture. The symposium is co-organized with Highline Art, the Verilis Center for Art and Politics at the New School, um, and is convened in the context of artist Sam Duran's Highline Plinth commissioned Untitled Drone, and our focus theme at the Verilis Center asks for protocols. Sam Duran's Untitled Drone is a large-scale art commission that intends to increase visibility around intentionally obscured drone warfare and surveillance perpetuated by the U.S currently on view at the Highline at 30th Street through August, 2022. The work continues Highline Art's mission of presenting new, powerful, thought-provoking artworks that generate and amplify some of today's most important conversations. Inspired by this artwork, the symposium brings together leading experts, artists, activists, academic practitioners across a diverse range of disciplines to examine contemporary intersections of drone and drone warfare arts and culture, and to demystify the twined histories of surveillance and drone warfare. It is a topic that we've taken over the last two years as part of our Ask for Protocols focus theme, including a seminar with, the High, with Highline Art in September of last year titled Drones and the Bird's Eye View. A recording of that and other programs are found in the Verilis Center's website. As we begin, I have a few announcements regarding the logistics for today's event. These are also being posted in the chat, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, throughout the presentation and discussion, we encourage you uh, to ask questions. Please use the Q&A function to do so. It's located at the bottom of your screen. Our moderator will select questions um, for you, from you. If you would like to use the closed captioning, please also go to the bottom of your Zoom screen and cl click on the CC option. There you'll be able to turn on captions. If you have any technical questions, please also use the Q&A function to ask those. Lastly, in the coming days um, after the series, a recording of this event will be posted on the Highlines and Verilis Center websites for future viewing. Although we're gathered in a virtual space together, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that I come to you from Brooklyn on the ancestral lands of the Munsi, Lenape, and Canarsie. If you're interested in finding out the name of the indigenous peoples, whose land you live on, please visit the link in the chat. I would like to now introduce my colleague and our events moderator, Melanie Kress. Melanie Kress is a curator and writer based in New York. She is the associate curator for Highline Art, where since 2014, she has commissioned and produced projects with artists, including Maria Teresa Alves, Lubaina Hamid, Zoe Leonard, Ligia Lewis, Sable Ellis Smith, Will Rawls, among many others. In 2010, she co-founded and directed the Brooklyn Brace project space, Concrete Utopia. She holds a BA in art history and visual arts for Barnard College and an MA in contemporary art theory from Goldsmiths College. She's a critic at Yale School of Art. Melanie, thank you for gathering us all um, and for being here today. Please join us. Ariola, thank you so much. And thank you um, for all of your partnership and your work uh, bringing this entire series together, it's kind of amazing to realize that all of us with Sam and with the Vera List Center have been in conversation about this program and with Arthur Hall and Michelle for almost three years at this point and you know, many months convening all of the details. So thank you again for all of your work um, and your collaboration to everyone. Um, I am so thrilled to be joined here today by artists Sam Durant and Omar Fast. As you know, and Ariola mentioned, Sam's Highline Plinth Commission Untitled Drone has been the inspiration for this entire three-day symposium that has um, been so long in the making. Over the past year, we've been really glad to be able to extend Sam's vision from this large-scale artwork to public engagement projects, including these two symposia, this one, and last year's was concentrated on surveillance a zine that you can find on our website and next to the work on the Highline and many resources and readings that are also available on our website. 
Beyond his work on the High Line, Sam Durant is an artist based in Berlin, working across drawings, sculptures, installations, and community-driven public projects, examining the ways in which groups of people make their values visible and heard in public space. Um, for today's talk, we will begin by sharing Omer's film, 5,000 Feet is Best from 2011, which has been a touchstone for artworks addressing drone warfare and conversations around drones, aesthetic representations, and storytelling for over 10 years. Amar, as many of you know, is a visual artist and filmmaker whose practice combines documentary and fictional materials. Um, both artists, as I mentioned, are living in Berlin and joining us from the evening over there today. And we're so glad to have you here sharing the background and inspiration for your works. Um, so I will be sharing Omer's film. It's about a half an hour long, after which we will pass to Sam, who will share some images and the background and even some behind the scenes for creating Untitled Drone. And then um, we will join together in the conversation and, and welcome again your questions throughout in the Q&A. So without further ado. Everything okay? Yeah. Yeah. I'm okay. So what do you want to talk about? That's what I was going to ask you. Man, I don't want to talk about anything. You're the one paying, remember? Not paying that much. You want to pay me more? You okay? Yeah, it's just junk food. <coughs> These guys have to be here? I didn't realize you'd be filming. We can stop if you're uncomfortable. Yeah, right. Well, let's hurry up. I've got a uh, doctor's appointment in one hour. OK. What's the difference between you and someone who sits in an airplane. There's no difference between us. We do the same job. But you're not a real pilot. So what? You're not a real journalist. No, I mean. I know what you mean. You're talking about bodies and places, Euclidean shit, like train drivers in the 1880s or something. You sure you're OK? There was this guy here who loved trains, you know. I don't know, he was like a 40-year-old guy. Um, harmless, maybe a little retarded. His dad bought him a train set when he was a baby, and that was the last time he saw him. Loved trains ever since. You know, most of us outgrow this phase when we discover sports and jerking off, but this guy didn't. His obsession just grew. He watched the trains for years. He hung around train yards, made friends with mechanics. Like a medieval apprentice, he learned it all just by looking. Wait a minute. Is this someone you served with? Anyway, one day he goes to the driver's lounge at the station and pulls out a bolt cutter. He breaks open a locker and puts on a uniform. He takes the vest, the ID card, even the shoes, and goes to work like it's nobody's business. Out on the platform, it's just past lunchtime. The staff has full bellies, and nobody notices. 
He boards a train full of commuters and sits in the driver's seat. He pulls the handbrake or whatever, and he's off. He drives the big choo-choo train all day long, making all the right stops on time. The motherfucker could have won an award for on-time performance. Funny thing is, the light at the end of the tunnel is just another tunnel. What does that mean? I don't know. Irony? Disappointment? The retard left his keys in the real driver's locker. He only realized it when he got home later that night. The police caught him trying to break into his own house by climbing in through his own window. OK, so why does the guy have to be black? I didn't say he was black. Did anyone mention color? The guy took a public train for a joyride and got busted climbing in through his own window. I didn't say anything about race. That's all there is to it. All right. What does this have to do with being a drone pilot? The moral's the same, all right? You keep your work life and your domestic life separate. You're not serious. You don't like it? Why don't you ask me a better question? All right. Have you ever seen the light of God? Five thousand feet's the best. We love it when we're sitting at five thousand feet. You have more description. Um, plus, at five thousand feet, I mean, I can tell you what type of shoes you wear <laughs> from a mile away. <laughs> I can tell you what type of clothes the person's wearing, like they have a beard, their hair color, and everything else. So they're very clear cameras on board. Um, we have the IR infrared, which we can switch to automatically and that'll pick up any heat signatures or cold signatures. I mean, if someone sits down, let's say, on a cold surface for a while and then gets up, you'll still see the heat from that person for a long time. It kind of looks like a white blossom just shining up into heaven. It's quite beautiful. Um, I mean, heck, if you see somebody light up a cigarette on there, that's a huge beacon. You just see a very white glow coming from that area. And you're just on a preset path flying a circular orbit, watching them as they're smoking from about two to three miles away. You could be following them and they wouldn't hear you nor see you. And um, I'll set the laser um, on a spot. You'll see a box pop up. And what it does is it locks in those pixels as we're circulating. And the computer will uh, figure out the trajectory, the distance, and the speed, and come up with an estimated time that it would take for the missile to impact. Um, the pilot will get all the clearances that are necessary to fire. He'll release the missile, and I'll guide it in onto its target.
What are you doing? We're here. Everything okay? Yeah. Yeah. Everything's okay. So what do you want to talk about? That's what I was going to ask you. Man, I don't want to talk about anything. You're the one paying, remember? Not paying that much. You want to pay me more? You okay? Oh, yeah, it's just junk food. <clears throat> so these guys have to be here? I didn't realize we'd be filming. We can always stop if you're uncomfortable. Yeah, right. Well, let's hurry up. I've got a doctor's appointment in one hour. OK. What's the difference between you and someone who sits in an airplane? There's no difference between us. We do the same job. But you're not a real pilot. Well, so what? You're not a real journalist. No, no, no. I mean. I know what you mean. You're thinking about bodies and trenches, rats running around. Mustard gas, World War One, right? You sure you're okay? Did you hear about that couple that caught the Luxor? They check into hotels with this one big suitcase full of trousers, blue jeans, chinos, slacks, you name it. A whole selection of labels and sizes. The man would hang them up in the shower, wool to cotton, light to dark. The woman would dress for business and put on a name tag like she's in town for a conference. Then they'd say goodbye like it's the last time they'll see each other. He would go down first to play the slots and she'd cruise the casino alone, prowling around for the right target. What's the right target? Everyone. Clueless tourists, convention goers, university students, divorcees, anyone wearing trousers who's single and in possession of credit. Anyway, after chatting them up and making sure they're not dangerous, the woman would invite them up to her room She'd act all sexy and mysterious in the elevator, telling them she's married, but that nothing turns her on more than the one night stand in Sin City, blah, blah, whatever. As soon as they stepped through the door, she'd be all over them. It was never really clear how much was acting and how much desperation. She'd tear off their pants and then show them just enough to want to wait in the bed while she went to the little girl's room. Where all the pants were. Exactly. In the bathroom, she'd pick out a pair, just like the ones the guy in the bed had, and then do a little switcheroo before getting back in the sack. But just then, her partner would walk in and pretend to discover them. You can imagine the rest. There'd be chaos, lots of gorilla-type shoving and throwing stuff, and the half-naked man would be allowed to run out or he'd be thrown out sometimes with the wrong trousers and sometimes with no trousers at all. Come on. The thing with the pants is a bit much. Oh, really? For most men, being caught with their pants down is so mortifying that they'd rather lose their wallet than hang around naked in a hotel corridor. Either way, those who stuck around and made a racket would get their pants back after the relevant details were copied off their credit cards. All right. What does this have to do with being a drone pilot? Nothing. I work for casino security now. We tell these stories to make our life a little less boring. OK, so getting back to Afghanistan. Pakistan. Right. Tell me about one of your missions.
Usually after we got done with work and then getting back home, you had about two hours before you had to go to sleep for work the next night. Because usually I wouldn't get home until 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, you jump in the shower to get your breakfast, play some video games for, you know, for four hours and then try to sleep. <laughs> A lot of guys, believe it or not, over there play video games <laughs> in their free time. Um, I guess that's their way of unwinding. Mine were a lot of role-playing games, or flight simulators. I, I guess Predator is similar to playing a video game, but playing the same video game four years straight every single day on the same level. Like, one time I just watched the same house for a month straight <laughs> for at least 11 hours every day for a month. <laughs> but then you have your moments when there's a real emergency going on, and that's just where stress comes into play. How do I hit that truck? And in what way do I hit that truck? And how far away should I put the missile to get the truck? So that way I don't have any damage to the surrounding buildings or to the people or hurt anybody else's life that's around there. And uh, sometimes I make mistakes. I mean, there's horror sides to work in Predator. You see a lot of death. You know, you see it all, as I said, they can tell you what type of shoes you're wearing from that far away. Hell, it's pretty clear about everything else that's happening. I mean, there came a point after you know, five years of doing this that it was just I, I had to think about, wow, there's so much loss of life that was a direct result of me. I mean, there was a lot of personal stuff I had to go through, a lot of chaplains I had to talk to just because. And the one factor that they talked about that helped me is that if it wasn't me who was doing it, then some new, some new kid would be doing it, but worse. I was 26 at the time. And a lot of people look like, how can you have PTSD if you weren't actively in a war zone? While technically speaking, every single day I was active in a war zone. I mean, I may not have been personally in harm, but I was directly affecting people's lives over there every single day. Um, there's stress that comes with that. I mean, with having a fire, or having a to see some of the, the death, to, to see what's going on, um, having anxiety, um, looking back on a certain situation or incident over and over and over, you know, uh, bad dreams, loss of sleep. You know, it's not like a video game. <laughs> I can't switch it off. It's always there. Just. Um, there's, there was a lot of stress with that, and they kind of call it virtual stress. Would you like me to clean your room, sir? Or should I come back? Should I clean your room? It's not my room. I'm visiting someone. I'll come back later, sir. Everything okay? Yeah. It's my lucky day. So what do you want to talk about? That's what I was going to ask you. <laughs> Man, I don't want to talk about anything. You're the one paying, remember? Not paying that much. You want to pay me more? You're okay? Mm, that's just junk food. <coughs> These guys have to be here? I didn't realize you'd be filming. We can always stop if you're uncomfortable. Yeah, right. 
Okay, then, well, can we hurry up? I've got a doctor's appointment in one hour. Okay. What's the difference between you and someone who sits in an airplane? Uh, there's no difference between us. We do the same job. But you're not a real pilot. Well, so what? You're not a real journalist. No, I mean... I know what you mean. You're thinking about Orville and Wilbur, Kitty Hawk, Top Gun, Red Baron, whatever. Sure you're okay? Mom, Dad, Johnny, and little Zoe are going on a little trip. Let's say it's the weekend and the family loves the outdoors. Or maybe they need to get away for a while because of problems Dad's having with the provisional authority. Either way, on a bright Friday morning, they pack up the station wagon with food and blankets and good stuff for the long drive. And they leave their house locked for good. So the family drives down their quiet block on a weekend morning on their way to the country. They take a left and a right, stop at the usual checkpoints, present their documents to the occupying forces. It's the same familiar route Dad takes every day of the week when he drives to work. But now he's not driving to work, so instead of driving into town, he gets on the freeway. No, 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 no camera. The drive is long, the trip is boring. Pretty soon everyone is passed out in the car except for dad. Mom has a map in her bag somewhere in the back, but dad is a proud, caring husband and he doesn't want to wake her. In these parts of the country, it's hard to get lost anyway. There's one road and it snakes along the mountains forever. Inshallah, we'll get there. One hour later, the roads aren't so good anymore. Dad isn't sure if they're lost, but the road looks familiar, so he puts faith in his instincts. The car bumps along at a much slower pace when Dad suddenly sees several men up ahead. They're digging or doing some work on the road. There's also a white pickup truck, something very common to the folks who live out here in the middle of nowhere. Dad slows down even more. It's not strange to see farmers out here, although these guys are not in the field and there's no sign saying there's road work ahead. The men spot the car and stop what they're doing. They step onto the road and watch as the family gets nearer. Dad can see that one of them has a shovel and the other two have some working tools or maybe sticks. Are they shepherds? There are no goats anywhere, no sheep, no camels. The earth on the side of the road is like hard clay. Digging into it with one shovel is no walk in the park. Dad stops the car about 50 feet away. He can see the men very clearly now. The one with the shovel is younger, almost a teenager. He wears a traditional headdress. The other two are older. They're dressed in clothes more typical to tribes from further south, and they're armed with Kalashnikovs. Dad looks at the men. The men look at Dad. He knows who they are and what they're doing, but he doesn't care. It's none of his business. He just wants to be allowed to pass and is not looking for trouble. One of the men waves Dad along, but also holds up his weapon. The other man approaches. Both he and the digger look on with suspicion. Dad edges the car forward. Just then, Mom wakes up. She sees the men and is immediately close to panicking. Dad whispers for her to be quiet and continues. The men are almost in line with the car now. They bend forward, peering in. Fortunately, the kids are still sleeping. Dad passes the men slowly and then steps on the gas. The crisis is over and it's best to get out of here. The men watch as the car pulls away. Dad takes mom's hand and squeezes it. Just then, a shrieking sound pierces the still air cleaving through it like the cry of a heavenly messenger.
The Hellfire missile hits the ground before anyone can react, nearly vaporizing the three men on impact. The pickup truck takes most of the damage, but the station wagon isn't spared. It pulls up ahead and waits, generously, patiently. Time passes. Time is on my side. Seeing the world from above doesn't just flatten things. It sharpens them. It makes relationships clearer. The family continues their journey. Their bodies will never be buried. Sorry, I gotta take this. I'll be back in a minute. On that specific mission of the night, I was checking routes for IEDs, looking for improvised explosive devices. And I would just be searching through the streets, a lot of side streets. I'll scan those roads and it was a night here in Vegas and it was a daytime there. Um, but I came to a spot in the middle of the road that was darker than the road itself which for the infrared camera means that darker images are showing as warmer. And it looked like there was a line going. Now, uh, what they didn't know at the time, which they do know now, which is not classified really, is that when an individual digs up soil and tries to put a metallic object underneath the soil, that metallic object is showing a different temperature than the surrounding soil. Because it's handled and then put down there and it hasn't had a chance to just absorb into that ambient temperature of the surrounding area. Um, you'll see it quite clearly when you're looking at an infrared image. And then when you have a length of wire as well that was spooled up in a different temperature area, and you put that on the road and try to shuffle up dirt, now that dirt is a different temperature. It'll either be cooler or hotter from shuffling around the cord. Now following the line, it goes to the side of the road where there was some houses that weren't fully constructed and I'm looking around, and I'm seeing a little guy smoking on the roof, and this wannabe terrorist is just sitting there, and he's being real slick, not even moving. Just looking around constantly, trying to, waiting for, you know, a Humvee or one of the military vehicles to show up to detonate, and there's, you know, four or five guys, and they're just sticking around. You can tell they're up to no good, that there's, you know, an ambush. Um, so we call it in, and then we're given all the clearances that are necessary all the approvals and everything else. And then we did something called the Light of God. The Marines like to call it the Light of God. It's our uh, laser targeting marker. Uh, we just send out a beam laser, and when the troops put on their uh, night vision goggles, they'll just see this light that looks like it's coming from heaven, right on the spot, <laughs> coming out of nowhere from the sky. It's quite beautiful. Um, then usually we have other outside observers that come into the GCS at this point. 
just to kind of watch and to monitor the situation. And um, the people who sit in the main building, they have projected images up on the wall of the camera feeds that are coming out, like everything up to the Pentagon can see what we're doing on this feed. And we fired off a Hellfire missile and got the target. I mean, there didn't quite stand into me that, hey, I just killed someone. My first time, I was within my first year there. It didn't quite impact. You know, it was later on through a couple more missions that the dreams started. I know we've been many, having many conversations over the last months about this being the 20th anniversary of the war on terror, which we will also hear about in our next conversation at 3 p.m. And you know, as I've already said, that this is um, Omar, your work was made in 2011, and it strikes me, you know, every time I watch this piece about really how powerful it is and how many different actors and players there are in this conversation and how many of the narratives stay the same and how many of the narratives shift and change. Um, I am gonna open up for Sam to please come on the screen. Um, and I'm already thinking about the conversation topics that we'll have together. Um, but Sam, I will open up and we have a few slides of your work um, that we'll share and I'll invite you to um, talk about the background for Untitled Drone um, and its exhibition so far on the Highline. Great, thanks. Thanks, Melanie. Um, yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's hard to follow uh, Omer's uh, powerful film. That's for sure. Um, and uh, uh, I should I should say Omer's work is a real inspiration to me. I mean, strangely enough, uh, when I began planning for the Untitled Drone. I, I didn't know about that particular film of Omer's. It wasn't until actually after we um, long into the into the pro project that I that I found out about it. Um, uh, so, you know, I wish I could say it was a kind of influence for me, um, but it was a really nice uh, kind of coincidence to 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 see to discover that film as I was working on this project and and um, to see that he had done such a brilliant project in this um, working in this sort of um, arena. Um, we'll, we'll probably talk about that more in the, in the Q and A, this intersection of aesthetics and, 
and warfare and violence um, and, uh, and, and how these things have, you know, over historically and in the, mo in the moment kind of interlink in very disturbing uh, ways. So um, uh, I should just say, maybe you could just click a little bit through the, the slides of the installation of the project. So I was invited to submit a proposal for the Highline Plinth. And um, <clears throat> I'd been thinking a lot about this idea of bringing um, an image of the Predator drone uh, into, into um, the United States and particularly into to, uh, New York because of the um, you know, potential audience and, and the sort of um, uh, the distance between uh, a place like New York and um, the places where drones and unmanned uh, surveillance aircraft and so forth are being deployed, you know, so far away from the US, so far out of our, our mind and everyday uh, consciousness. Um, and this struck me as some, you know, some, something like the, the most, you know, so, sort of specifically disturbing aspects of drone war warfare, the, the, the really provocative dimension of it um, was, was this combination of its, its invisibility, its, its, and its ability to be sort of out of mind, out of, um, uh, out of our vision, out of our thoughts, out of the news, et cetera. Um, and while being commanded from uh, these bases, mainly in the United States, some overseas, of course, in Germany, um, and some other other military bases, but mainly from the US. So um, this sort of um, real disconnect uh, on, on, a, on a couple of different levels that, that, that I thought was so um, disturbing. And, and really the impulse was to, was to bring, bring this, this um, iconic yet invisible form uh, into physical manifestation and literally to cast a shadow um, and, to, and to sort of appear uh, in, a, in a highly populated area in the US. And of course, you know, this location is, um, you know, is, is just extraordinary. So it's it really an amazing opportunity for me to have a, a site like this um, and to, to have a situation that the High Line offers of so much, um, such a high visitorship, so much visibility in terms of the site being over on top of a main <laughs> avenue. Uh, so the re really extraordinary location. Couldn't, couldn't ask for more public, <laughs> uh, publicly and more highly visible space. And this is, this is just a little um, kind of animation. Um, one of the key aspects about the work is that it's, um, it, the 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 airplane form itself is mounted on a pole and it and it rotates in the wind, um, pointing the direction of the wind, sort of telling you which way the wind's blowing. And the the stepped marble base, the corners are aligned to the cardinal points, so it sort of acts as a as an orientation, as a as a weather wind vane or an orientation um, device, actually. So it 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 points towards a other kind of metaphorical uh, readings. Um, and of course, I, I, this is the preliminary um, concept model. And this is where I really tried to work out this um, abstracting of the form. So, because I didn't want it to be um, something that was, you know, really terrifying to people. Uh, so I we took all the elements off it, the surveillance elements, the, 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 the rocketry, the missiles, all of the instruments and everything, and, and tried to really streamline it um, so that it, it, it would take the shape and, and be a kind of representation of the drone. It would remind people of it without terrorizing. Also, you know, I understand quite well the, the, the power of artworks and the power of representation. So again, uh, it wasn't about creating a, a traumatic situation for people, but but really 
an invocation or to evoke um, the specter of the drone. And these are these are the fabrication photos. It was um, put together, built, and and designed with a wonderful team at uh, a place in Los Angeles called Cinnabar. Um, and the the lead engineer on it ap actually happened to be a, a, an aeronautic engineer. So it was a really wonderful um, experience working with them. They really understood how to put it together and make it very safe. Of course, <laughs> it's been through a hurricane already. So, you know, it's, you know, it's very stable. Um, yeah, and then um, in addition to this programs like we're in the middle of today, we've done a, a number of different kinds of events and programming and online things and provided so many resources around the issues. And one of the things that I, I really love is this, um, this zine that we that we put together, which it kind of gives a basic overview of, of drones and drone technology, the development, how they're interconnected um, in all these ways that again, we don't, we don't see, we not, we're not really aware of um, uh, most of us in our day-to-day -day lives. So, so really trying to just give kind of some information for visitors and viewers that are that are more interested that want to add that the maybe the sculpture provokes some questions and you know we try to <clears throat> give some material and some context uh, as well. Thank you so much, Sam, for that background and stop um, I'd like to invite Omar also to join us and we can dive into conversation. Thank you both for your incredible work. Um, I think we'll talk a lot about time as I have been mentioning already in the introductions. And I'd like to share also, there are many folks here who've been on a number of conversations over the last two days. And there are so many amazing themes and threads that have been coming out between geographical locations, people coming from algorithms and technology, artists, musicians from around the world. And one thing that we heard last, yesterday with Eric Lynn Greenberg, Tanya Lucep, and Lucy Suchman speaking about algorithmic warfare um, is that one of the most important elements in decision making is time, thinking about humans being replaced by algorithms or other machines. Um, and Sam, I'm so glad that you shared the animation of the work, but can you both talk about how you're thinking about time in these works? And where there's this repetition, this sort of strangeness of how this person is remembering or not remembering. And Sam, how you decided to deal with monumentality, but still have this element of, of time in. Omar, maybe we can start with you. So um, I guess the work is um, initially conceived to reflect a, a psychological state and the psychological state that it reflects is of its subject. And I had met with the um, young person who appears uh, in the film uh, for three days in Las Vegas, and I talked to him quite a lot um, uh, over these three days about his work and um, about his life. And the conversations were very much characterized by tension, nervousness, anxiety on his part, uh, because he wasn't sure uh, what would get him in trouble. And of course, I tried to create a, um, a safe, secure, and comfortable space for him and let him know that anything that he said would not uh, that he didn't want to be used in the film will not be used. But he kept on cutting the um, conversation short and leaving the hotel room. We did this in a hotel room and he would leave to the corridor. And so half of the film, uh, half the footage of the material that I had uh, on camera, on the record, um, was what we did in the room. And the other half, which was often more interesting, was outside in the corridor and it was off camera. And there were, it was things that he could tell me one-to-one, uh, -one, but he did not want to have um, uh, used in the film. So I came back with this very, let's say, disrupted and incomplete record, uh, aiming to reflect this disrupted and incomplete state that this young man was in. Um, he claims to have been traumatized by his work uh, and to have suffered from PTSD. And this work was made in 2010. So this was well before, I think, the, uh, the system and the powers that be 
actually recognize that people who are uh, involved in military operations via the drone program could be traumatized by the work. That kind of diagnosis uh, and the support and the help that came um, to these people, that, that, that appear much later on. And so I was interested temporally in reflecting this very um, disrupted, traumatized state of the subject. And that means that the sense of linear time is completely disrupted. That instead, the logic, the temporal logic of the film is one where repetition, you know, the, the, this kind of compulsion to repeat in order to master uh, something that's, that's traumatic or something that's incomprehensible is something that the film very much follows. Um, yeah. Thanks, Omer. Um, and these are such important points that I feel like the controversies and conversations about PTSD um, for drone pilots and operators is still ongoing. But Sam, could you speak to this question about time? Thinking both about the kinetic work, but how time functions for a, a work outdoors for 18 months. Yeah, no, exactly. And um, <clears throat> it's such a different relationship to time. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, the capacities of the narrative form or the, the cinematic form, the storytelling um, capabilities that Omer's talking about. And, and, you know, I mean, he's working on many different layers to kind of create the, this um, psychological um, uh, state of the, of the, the protagonist in the film. Um, and and that, that's so effective and, and you see it, he's, he's done it so uh, brilliantly in the film. Whereas a sculpture, you know, particularly a sculpture outside, uh, especially one that is um, monumental, I, you know, I, I don't see my work as in any way, shape or form being a monument, uh, anything but I would, I would, if anything, classify it as a counter monument. But the whole notion of the monument, of the monumental, is a sense of timelessness and a sense of um, inevitability that this is here, it will always be here, like the pyramids, like the great obelisks, you know. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's a kind of um, um, a trope or, a, or, a, or even a, a kind of um, unconscious uh, image that we might have when we see a large scale marker of some sort, you know, this physical presence. And I mean, I, I think the, the fact of it rotating was so important to me and the fact that it, that the base of it um, was aligned to the cardinal points so that it, it really, it, it would become something else. And that, it, you know, if viewers come to it um, at different points uh, during the day, during the years, whatever, um, it, it is different in that sense. And so, um, and it, you know, and it, at the same time, coming back to this discursive idea about um, the subject matter itself, like, you know, when I conceptualized it, it was, it was the Obama administration. And, and as, you know, as when Omar did his work, this was the, the you know, the real, the, the sort of um, <clears throat> proliferation of drone warfare and un, sort of unmanned warfare. Uh, and then um, it seemed to kind of decline during the Trump administration. It was still happening, but not to the same degree. And then, I mean, it was almost like the week that we put the uh, sculpture up on the High Line, there was this catastrophic drone strike in Afghanistan. Uh, and it, you know, the New York Times did a whole story about it, um, exposing. Um, Again, uh, you know, the slaughter of, of innocents, um, botched intelligence, et cetera. So it, you know, it was a kind of grisly reminder that, um, that this issue is still with us. So I think having the work up for a long period of time also, um, unfortunately, <laughs> um, is, is keeping us aware of the relevance of it. And the fact that, you know, as time goes on, history seems to be um repeating itself well and this point about the news is so important there have been a lot of conversations both over the last few days and at our symposium last year about whether you can use technologies of surveillance or you can use the drone itself in order to challenge the drone 
Um, and I'm wondering about how the news has functioned for both of you in relationship to these works, either as an inspiration to make it or about aesthetic choices that you're making that you wanna be different or using images from the news in order to challenge how the news is representing drones. Can you talk about how news and media came into your thinking around coming up with these works? And we'll start well, again. I, I think just picking up on, on what Sam has just talked about, I think the notion of monumentality in, in a climate or in an era which is very much concerned with re-examining monuments and pulling them down, I see the, the act of, you know, the, the artistic uh, act of putting up this monument to something which is invisible uh, and yet is acting in, I, I will say, our name because I'm also an American citizen uh, and bringing that in a sense home as this kind of reminder. Um, I think this is something which is, works very uh, closely um, in reporting, in, in a sense, reporting on something almost like a silent um, uh, presence that haunts uh, the cityscape. And yet at the same time, there's a slight kind of ambivalence or a slight kind of uh, contradiction or paradox in what that sculpture does because it is a weather vane. And the weather vane is of course the most fickle thing. I mean, it changes uh, with the slightest kind of uh, provocation or the slightest kind of impulse. And so I think there's this kind of, in a, in a sense, if we speak about time and we speak about the news, there is a sense of this monumentality that's always present. And yet this very monumentality is so fickle and it's so subject to change. I mean, that, I think that's a, that's a very nice little sort of compressed uh, paradox that's uh, uh, present in that, in that work. Absolutely. Sam, do you want to add? Um, I'm going to do all my um, speaking events with Omer. <laughs> He's much better at explaining my work. <laughs> right on, Sam. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, yeah. when, I, when I made um, the film, um, it, it was in 2010. And I think at the time, there was much less um, you know, it was not as present, uh, at least for me, it wasn't. I mean, I do live in Germany and I have been here since since uh, 2001. Um, and it was not as present. So there was this kind of impulse to begin with to to um, make something visible, which is invisible. And this is very often the impulse behind uh, the work that I make, um, knowing full well that this this desire, this, this kind of uh, scopophilia, this kind of voyeurism, uh, th this kind of curiosity is highly problematic. Um, you know, this kind of giving form and the, the problem of representation is very much something that's embedded uh, in the work. So the work tries, in a sense, there is a paradox that haunts that work, uh, which has to do with the collapse, which has to do with trauma, in a sense, or the, the kind of the central sort of paradox of the work in this, is that you want to discover something which is invisible. You want to give it a, a shape. And yet that thing is very fickle or that thing will not coalesce into a particular shape. It's always slipping away. Um, and this is why the work is uh, structurally made in such a way that, um, um, you know, just at the point where you feel like you can reach some kind of level of understanding, uh, the narrator slips out, you know, and you find yourself suddenly in a different genre or in a different moment or in a different kind of a mode of storytelling and you have to sort of, I hope, I think, um, critically engage with the mater material rather than sort of consuming it um, as a means of like, uh, you know, reaching some kind of catharsis about how horrible this 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 is um, that's being done in, in our name or um, that's being done in faraway places where uh, we won't go to. Sam, I, I want to talk to you about this slippage and some of your inspirations coming from abstraction in the decades before when you were making this work. But first, Amir, I, I want to ask you, there's another work that you made a few years before this, if I have my timeline right, called The Casting. Um, and I have thought about this work a lot and how you're staging and thinking about the military. And, and for both of you also, how did you come to this topic? What was the inspiration to think about drones? Was it because you were already dealing with the military as a topic and these sort of difficult relationships and modes of representation, was that work an inspiration or was there something else that brought you to the topic? 
Um, should I should I get this? Sure. Or, Sam, do you want to? And then we'll we'll pass to Sam. Yeah. Um, well, the casting was um, much more concerned with one particular person's story and um, has very little to do with the kind of let's call it the systemic conditions, the sort of structural conditions in which that person operated. Um, and with 5,000 feet, um, you know, I, I, I talked about invisibility and I made several works that tried to deal with what I call liminal figures or figures that are somehow imbued, empowered, or by, by virtue of by desperation or by, by um, you know, uh, uh, life circumstances have to traverse uh, borders. And these could be geopolitical uh, borders, but more interestingly, they're often the borders between the private and the public. Uh, in this uh, case of uh, drone warfare, the, the, the um, you know, the, the theater of combat, the theater of war and um, uh, civilian life. And what I think the, what's interesting about this technology in a sense, and the work is always trying to reflect on how uh, technology um, both reflects and shapes our, our, our desires. And what I think drone warfare does in a sense is it distills uh, uh, this wish, you know, and a wish which is almost uh, ancient, you know, from the first moment at which, uh, um, you know, a humanoid picked up a rock or a projectile and decided to throw it at that mammoth or that enemy. Um, you know, thus protecting one's own body um, and amplifying one's ability to strike and do harm. I think what the, the drone does is, in a sense, very much, it, it exists very much on that continuum. You know, it, it allows us, it grants us these almost um, uh, superhuman powers to be, um, you know, to be present uh, without being a danger, to see without being seen, and to kill without being at risk. And this is a very dangerous, um, you know, this is a very, very dangerous technology because it, in a sense, it sublimates risk, you know, and that's what makes it so attractive um, for decision makers and for politicians. And uh, Sam mentioned Obama. I mean, the work was, I voted for Obama and, you know, within months of taking office, you know, the, the amount of uh, drone strikes and uh, missions that were undertaken had uh, started to multiply in an almost kind of exponential uh, way. And so there was a sense of, in a sense, collapse. Uh, yeah, the, the, the old rules of warfare where you pack soldiers, you know, in this kind of Homeric, you know, almost like an ancient Greek way, we, we go into the boats and, you know, like Odysseus or whatever, we, we pack ourselves and we have to traverse the ocean and we have to be and engage in a sense, even in a, in a conflict with a foreign uh, uh, culture and a foreign peoples. Um, the drone, what, uh, what it promises in a sense is it, it sublimates all that. I mean, it, it negates all that. It says, no, you can be at home in the morning you could take part in warfare in the evening, and then you could be, you know, be in time for uh, home for dinner. And at the same time, you don't need to risk, uh, you know, uh, boots on the ground, uh, soldiers' lives, uh, munitions, uh, treasure, and all that. So there's this kind of, you know, a dangerous sort of, um, I guess, uh, a lure that the technology sort of uh, uh, promises politicians. Mm -hmm. It's 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 risk free. And yet what it does is it, 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 it actually amplifies the distance, yeah? There is, there is no contact, you know, the whole technology is predicated on the fact that there is a dematerializing of the bodies, very often brown bodies, who are incinerated and, and mutilated by, this, uh, um, by these actions. Well, and we've been having these conversations with so many folks and thinking also about algorithms at the next level. And, and we have a lot of brilliant journalists and, and, and um, folks will be joining us at three o'clock also to talk about this new state of war. Um, I'd like to pass back to Sam also, if you can talk about some of the military references that you were coming to in thinking about Untitled Drone. I know there were a number of works that you had in the works and research projects you had going on, um, but also the abstraction and the art historical references that were running alongside the, the warfare that you were thinking about as you were coming to this piece. Yeah, well, I, 
<clears throat> I was I did a project in uh, twenty uh, exhibition in twenty fourteen called Invisible Surrealists, and I think there, that was where the 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 project germinated because um, I was really looking at the effect of the First World War and uh, you know and and the Second World War as well, but primarily the First World War as a as a kind of shattering event in Europe. Um, uh, you know, psychologically, particularly, um, and the effects uh, it had on artists at that time, and, and particularly surrealists, and as they attempted to kind of cup, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, in, in reveal uh, aspects of the unconscious and the psyche. Um, you know, Andre Breton was famously um, at, at a, at a um, as a young man was stationed in a military hospital that was treating uh, the first victims of shell shock, what became, what later became known as shell shock. They didn't know what it was at first. Um, so, so this kind of injury, um, the, the, what we call PTSD now was first seen there at the, at, you know, on a mass scale. Uh, from the, um, you know, this industrial, this new industrial warfare, uh, as Omer mentioned, that, you know, the way we go to war, well, well, that really started with the First World War. Um, that was the beginning of this industrialized um, mass killing um, and the use of weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons and so forth, and massive bomb aerial bombardment and so forth and so on. So, thinking about that, how, how that affected artists and asking questions about, you know, okay, this was a period of incredible artistic change. You know, we move from figuration into abstraction and, and then we move to, you know, cubism and, you know, the sort of literal shattering of the, of the picture plane and so forth. Um, and, and, that's, and that's really what got me thinking about it. And of course, in relation to sculpture, we had a movement, um, particularly um, amongst the surrealists and surrealist adjacent artists like <laughs> um, Constantin Brancouche, um, uh, Jeanne Arp, people like that, um, of, of um, a kind of smoothing out of forms. And, and you know, Bird in Space was a real um, influence, I think, formally on uh, the drone sculpture, because again, I, I wanted to reference, you know, as, as Omer said, I wanted it to be as self-reflexive as possible. So I wanted it to register as an artwork, not as simply a reproduction of a predator drone, but that, that, it, that it was important for it to be seen as a representation, not the real thing. And that's, I think, a really important point. Um, and and the reason for that is is because I think in the, in the you know hopefully the realm of representation allows us as viewers to be able to step back from what we're looking at and see it uh, in a more uh, in a kind of estranged way, right? Mm -hmm. And and so I think you know the the hope with Untitled Drone was to create to understand that there is this affirmative power. Um, in, in technology and in spectacle and aesthetics, but uh, hopefully in the context of this artwork, there's also a negationary power. So there's a, there's a critical dimension, I think, as Omar was saying in his film, um, the self-reflexivity, the repetition, all of these things, the, 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 the inability to build a cohesive narrative, you know, beginning, middle, and end, um, but to, yeah, so, so kind of having these opposing forces in the work uh, was very important, so. I'm gonna pull a few questions that we have coming in already. Um, one, this is directed, I believe, to Omar, but I'll expand it also to you, Sam. Uh, curious if you would do the film differently now, when visibility isn't as much of an issue or visibility has been achieved, what, comes next and Omar you as you've said this work comes from 2010 Sam I can't believe it's six years ago now that you first proposed on titled drone could you both speak to whether you whether you would um, make these works differently or make a different work about drones today in 2022 Omar do you want to take that one first 
<laughs> Thanks for lobbing that at me, Sam. Um, no, I mean, I, I think what, what stays with me in that work is, in a sense, it's structure um, and, and this notion that there is um, almost a classical structure of having three acts. It's a three-act play. And the fact that none of these acts don't coalesce. So there is no, you know, catharsis or there's no sublimation at the end of it. And just to pick up on what um, Sam was uh, saying before, I think there is a formal, all, all of a sudden, almost an echo uh, formally. If you look at the shape of the drone, what's missing? The cockpit. What is a cockpit? It's a, it's a, it's a cage in a sense for housing the body. Um, so the ghost in the machine, in a sense, is missing from the machine. And, and, and this whole notion of sublimation, namely, not only of, of, of dematerializing warfare, uh, by extracting the pilot, extracting the body, and then distributing um, responsibility and distributing uh, warfare across, across a network, in a sense. Um, I think that speaks a lot about what the, what, what the dangers are in that, in, in that particular technology, namely that the ghost in the machine, the human, is no longer there. And of course, we have plenty of precedents to say that when the ghost is in the machine, horrible stuff happens, but um, what, what, the, what the drone does in a sense is that, uh, at least formally, it, it announces itself as something which is, I think, on, on, a, on a trajectory where, in a sense, uh, no responsibility uh, will happen, no human uh, governance or oversight will happen, and you will end up having, I don't know, algorithms or uh, various networking uh, situations making um, these decisions which affect people who are dematerialized and uh, made invisible. So I guess the answer is I wouldn't do it any differently. Sam? Yeah. Um, A difficult question to ask. I know all the work is still on view, but, or maybe the question is what's next? Well, I, I, just, I just wanted to add one, one thing. Um, which is um, in the United States, of course, um, yeah, we're, we're more, perhaps, I, I, I don't know, I think it's arguable um, that, that we're maybe more aware of um, automated warfare, unmanned drone warfare and so forth. We might be more, uh, slightly more aware of it um, now than we were 10 years ago uh, or, or 15 years ago. Um, again, I'd, I'd have to see the data on that. I'm not, I'm not convinced of it. But um, the thing that we will never see, no matter, I mean, you could run a story on the front page of every newspaper uh, about a drone strike somewhere that the US has carried out. You could run that every single day. The thing that will never be visible are the victims uh, in the United States. So you, you're not going to have um, uh, people uh, slaughtered. Um, you know, justifiably or not, you're not going to have the victims of those drone strikes visible. Uh, you're not going to have that, um, uh, you know, the, that relationship. Now, um, one of the thing, one of the big questions for me and probably for Omer as well is how does one represent um, the effects of violence, the effects of traumatic uh, uh, and significant and important things um, where, where violence is a, is a byproduct or a direct result of that. How do you represent that in an art form without um, spectacularizing it, without re-traumatizing victims, et cetera? I mean, all the problems of, of, that we have about this. So I think, I think Omer's film does a great job of that, of allowing us to imagine you know, who is, is going to be victimized. And I think that the, the incredible power of it is that we as viewers, he brings us to the place where we can imagine that the, the the little boy on the bicycle going through the neighborhood in in um in las vegas or, or wherever it is it looks like las vegas uh and the family you know having the interaction on the on the road so um and and i think for sculpture for 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 public art i think that's a, you know perhaps a more even more challenging and difficult thing like I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I, I think that that's a that's a you know for visual art, a sculpture, three dimensional static forms, you know this is a this is a question, and and I think 
I think what we're doing right now, all the symposiums, these amazing people are coming in talking about it, all the other things that we've done. I think that's for me a way of connecting to the to the horror uh, of this thing and to to the to the to the to the people who are receiving the sharp end of the spear, you know. So um, we're lucky enough to have Karen Kaplan in the audience here, who I know has written a lot on these subjects. And Karen, I'm going to read some and paraphrase some of your comment and your question, which I feel like we've also been addressing in terms of monumentality. And I also want to bring this question to our next conversation because I wasn't aware of these developments. Um, so Karen shares, the iconic representation of the drone used for warfare is often designed to evoke the predator. And the predator and reaper drones, the reapers come after the predator is larger, do signal some of the worst crimes in the execution of warfare in, zo in zones like Waziristan. But aerospace companies involved in the production of these large slow vehicles have seen their contracts with major militaries diminish in recent years as drone warfare has shifted to smaller, more flexible vehicles that are less expensive and more accessible to a wider set of consumer groups beyond nation states. Many of these drones are made by Turkish aerospace companies. Their operations can be less formalized than the now iconic setting of the operator in the container in Nevada in the container zone in the conflict zone half a world away. And then, so in this context, maybe this is a prompt for other artists making future works about drones. And this is a topic that's come up. You know, there's the challenge of when you have one image or one drone operator, that's a person that we can speak to. And, you know, we've talked also in earlier conversations about um, how you narrativize and how you humanize through the figure of an individual or the story of one person. Um, the challenges of imaging dispersed warfare, right? Like we're thinking about swarm drones as well and thinking also about data representation and so much of surveillance about being, about pattern recognition and data. Um, and then we will pose the question of, are there other artists that you've seen working today or other cultural practitioners or writers that you've seen who are addressing this kind of dispersed warfare in a way that you think is interesting or exciting? Well, I, I mean, the first person that comes to mind was someone that we would, was scheduled to be on the panel yesterday, um, and, I, and I try, <laughs> who unfortunately is, is ill. Um, and I tried to, to convince him to come on with Omer and I, uh, Aziz Hazara, and I think he's done some pretty extraordinary work um, and his experiences um, growing, living and growing up in Kabul with the kinds of um, surveillance and, and, you know, it's clear from his experiences that, that, that Kabul was a kind of testing ground. And, and I think that it's like many other places, uh, the US and the tech uh, military industrial complex is using these places, these faraway places um, where no one's watching, no one's looking. That's where they're testing their weapons out. They're testing their weapons out on a powerless, uh, helpless, communities um, all over the Middle East. Um, you know, these surveillance balloons they put up and they watch everyone and listen into everyone 24 seven. They just put the balloons up all over the city. <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's horrifying the degree to which they're living in. And then that's as, you know, as, um, as, uh, as you said in the question, then you have all these other newer technologies coming in and being tried out. The kind of um, we're using using the Middle East as a kind of testing ground for all this. And an important reminder that we saw in the symposium last year that a lot of these technologies are also being used commercially in the U.S. Um, but Omar, I'll ask if there's anyone that you would recommend for the audience um, whose work you think is exciting these days around this topic. I'm I'm horrible in these kinds of questions. Like if I have to answer a question like that in public, if somebody asks me. What my favorite color is, I would um, I, I would freeze like a deer in the headlights. So green. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. Green. I said green. <laughs> or, or red or blue. No, I, I can't do it. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, maybe I can I can uh, think about this and, and send you some links later. But I'm not a. I'm, I can't do these uh, off the cuff sort of. Uh, Making sure next time. 
But yes, um, we'll share Aziza's work. So our moderator yesterday, again, unfortunately, Aziza has been ill this week. Um, our moderator yesterday, Muhab Esmat, shared some of his work, which you'll be able to see on the recordings from that film. Um, I'll also share the other artists, Hajar Wahid and Sex of Freedy, um, as well as Guillermo Galindo and Raven Chacon, who we heard from earlier this week. Um, and there are many resources and other projects that you can see listed on our website as well. Um, I. We'll start to close us out here. I really appreciate both of you sharing so much with us. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you and to think so much about the trajectories over the past 10 and 20 years, thinking about these artworks and how public perception around drones um, and aesthetic representations have really changed. Um, I will pass it now to Ariel Apira, our amazing colleague from the Virala Center, um, who will close us out today. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you again, Melanie, Sam, and Omar for this really incredible conversation, um, providing us with an important framework for understanding representations of drones and the narratives that we tell about state and other actors operating them. Thanks to all of the co-presenters and colleagues who've made this series possible. Thank you to the members of the Highline Plinth Committee, contemporary art leaders committed to realizing major commissions and engaging in the public success of the Plinth who make the series possible. The Verilis Center's participation in remote control is made possible in part by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Andrew Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts and Board Foundation, the Kettering Fund, as well as the Verilis Center's board and the New School. Thank you to everyone who attended today's event. To dive in for our next conversation in the series, please join us later today on Friday, February 11th um, at three o'clock Eastern time for the sixth event in our symposium titled Surfacing the War on Terror Today, featuring Hina Shamsi, director of the ACLU's National Security Project, Sonia Kenenbeck, filmmaker and journalist, Chantal Maloney, working in international crimes and accountability for the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, and journal, journalist and author Spencer, uh, Spencer Ackerman, moderated by journalist and filmmaker Mary Hatayir. Two, two decades after the United States launched its war on terror, this global campaign of surveillance and violence continues to disproportionately target certain ethno-religious groups domestically and abroad through instruments operating outside the channels of government accountability, all in the name of domestic security. Charting the evolution of this largely invisible war and the central role the drones have played in enabling its international reach, this panel lays out the state of counterterrorism policy today under the presidency of Joe Biden and looks towards upcoming legal challenges in the US and in Europe, an often overlooked player in the realm of drone warfare. To learn more about the following events in the symposium and to sign up for our newsletters, please visit the Highline Art website as well as Verilis Center website that are being linked in the chat. See you soon and thank you for joining us. <laughs>